Um, yeah, thank you, Abby. Happy to be here. Um, this is a second time around for Ismail and I uh, at DTC. We had an awesome time in New York, a year, I don't know, six months ago or so. Um, but to quickly introduce Peak Support, which often gets confused with the other software companies, we are not a software company. We are a customer support outsourcing company. So we, do, we build operational teams, um, often starting with e-coms when they're just getting overwhelmed for the first time uh, and needing just one or two additional staff. We hire people around the world, US, Philippines, Colombia, um, and we, you know, we really fully manage those teams and put kind of operational rigor around customer support so that our clients can focus on their core competencies and we can worry about uh, the day-to-day -day of customer support teams. But they work dedicated, um, very much a part of our clients' brands and their own team. So um, it works really well in e-commerce. And um, Ismail is here. I'll let him introduce himself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ismail. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Wildgrain. We're a subscription business for healthy carbs. So we ship bread, pasta, pastries, frozen to your house, you put them in your freezer, and when you need them, you put them in your oven, and then you have fresh, warm sourdough bread, French croissants, pizza, pasta, delicious stuff, ready on the go for your meals. Um, we started in 2020. Um, I had my first son the week we incorporated the company, uh, and my wife and I started the company together, so it's been a rocky four years. <laughs> on a personal level, but professionally it was very fulfilling. And we work with Peak Support since I think year one of Wildgrain when we kind of got overwhelmed with customer support and built a pretty robust team now across you know, CX, marketing, and operations where Peak Support is very involved. Yeah, and we're not just here to talk about outsourcing in terms of um, the staff at Peak Support. So it'd be kind of a catch-all for the strategy you guys have, have had at, uh, in terms of your growth. So you've just to kind of start at the baseline, you kept your team super, super lean um, and put things into vendors from an early phase. Can you kind of talk about what roles did you hire for right away? Where are you at today as far as like a total staff and what everybody's doing? Yeah, we. Um, one of my mentors is uh, a person from ButcherBox who started his company and took it from zero to 500 million in four years. And his first advice was don't hire when you don't need to and stay as lean as possible as long as you can. So we tried to do that. Uh, so the first hires we made were a VP of marketing, a VP of operations, and that was it. We were four until I think we made 12 million and we outsourced everything, everything else. Uh, so that was the beginning, I think, for the first two years. Um, and then now we're eight people doing about, I think, 40 million in revenue, something like that. And I do remember you guys did bake your own bread for a small period of time, um, <laughs> but not anymore. So, so you've leaned on a lot of vendors. I mean, I guess you got this advice to do this. Why? Why is this the advice? The, the first the reason you do it is to avoid, you know, a, too, ma too much too many expenses on your company very early and put a burden on the growth part. So we wanted to figure out growth before growing the team, uh, the, which makes sense. And then the second part was just scale. Um, we knew frozen fulfillment and is complex. And so we wanted to hand that to people who know what they're doing. And so that was that was the main reason, and just keeping the PNL of the company very light and very asset light was very important to us. And I've also seen a lot of companies fail because they did the opposite. And the last ten years in DTC were a great example of that. So it was kind of the right time to look at, you know, at the wall and see what's still left. And we were like, okay, the ones that are left are the ones who were lean. And so what functions, you know, other than peak support, which I already talked about a little bit, but like what are the functions or the buckets that you'd say that these vendors are falling into now? Yeah, we, so I, when you start doing e-commerce, it's the same thing for pretty much everybody. You have your marketing agencies, and so you outsource a lot of the marketing. You keep a bunch of stuff, of core stuff in-house. Uh, you outsource um, a lot in the operations. So, you know, you have your pickback, you have your carriers, and then on CX, you have customer support and you know other lines of business that we 
outsourced as well. And so that allowed my team to stay focused on whatever is important to us, which was customer satisfaction, um, performance marketing and retention and shipping the boxes in great, uh, in great shape to our customers. And so I know a little bit about this already, so I know I'm leading you in direction, but you know, you guys, you obviously have to keep an eye. You're trusting a lot of people working some with us in the Philippines, some in warehouses around the country. Like how do you, you know, get to a place where you can trust or at least, or know what's going on, um, and rely on those vendors? Yeah, that's the second biggest advice I got after like, hey, outsource as much as you can is build tools that allow you to have real time, like really real time view on what your vendors are doing and detect mistakes, detect, you know, voluntary and voluntary performance drops, increases. And so the way we did that, I come from a tech background, so I'm a computer science PhD. I love writing code and so part of that was building this tech layer on top of every vendor and every line of business we have in the company to allow them to monitor and have a very real-time vision on how their vendors are doing so we do it for tech and we built like a tech layer uh, for sorry for marketing and we built a, a software tools for them to know how you know not just CAC and LTV but all sorts of attribution metrics and things like that in real time. How are the agencies performing? How is the podcast agency performing? All of that stuff. We did it for operations. How many boxes are arriving not cold to our customers in real time uh, so that we can go to the fulfillment center and say, hey, you're messing up in this location. This two days, you were not pulling your weight. Why? Help them fix it or you know, fire them in some cases. Um, and so tech was kind of like the, this overarching tool that allowed us to stay very lean, very small, but have really, really accurate view on what's going on in the business. And still now, like being a technical founder, is keeping all that stuff connected is still a big part of your role? Yeah, I hired uh, a for the first engineer to help me last year. And so that's been a huge help and allowed me to focus on something else and build more support tools for my teams. but. We, we joke that we are we have customers. The first one is obviously our own customer, and so building the tech for the customer, the, their member experience, the, the store, um, you know, how the PDPs and all the landing pages and things like that, but we have customers internal in the company. So I go to my head of CX and I say, hey, what can I do to my peak support team to help them go faster? What can I do to my marketing team to get them better reporting? What can I do for ops? to help them know better what's going on. And they give us, we have sheets, Google Sheets of like features they would want to get better. And they're very simple. This is high priority, this is low priority. And then we go through it and we just build the stuff for them. And so we have customers within the company and customers outside of the company is how we kind of build this. And you know, some vendors are good at it uh, and they help us get the data, help us. And some are less good at it. Some are. And so we, we are more or less involved depending on the vendor. This, it sounds like, this, to me at least, I don't know what everybody else here would think, a pretty unusual type of technical approach like for a small startup. Like what kind of a person, what kind of a developer background would you look for if you wanted to hire someone that, could, that was like a connector of systems the way that you guys are doing it? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I tell my team we're systems builders, not people managers. And it's very important for us to build systems that work and that can scale. And so what I hired and what I usually hire is full stack engineers that have some sensibility in, in the front end piece of, of the website and the, the store because I want them to be able to build stuff for our customers but also internally. And so full stack has been really good for us in terms of profile. Yeah, I feel like I don't know how many people at a five out of their first five hires, like a true full stack developer is unusual, I would imagine. Yeah, it's very unusual and very scary. People don't want to hire a technical person early. They usually rely on agencies. The problem of agencies is they, you know, you're gonna change them over time. So it's kind of like the only thing that we didn't outsource is tech, um, which I think played in our favor because 
at first it seems like laggy and you're wasting money and time because you're slower a little bit to, to hit the ground, but then you're building tools so specific to your business that you kind of gain speed and an unfair advantage to other brands when you have that expertise within the, the, within the business. Yeah. Cool. So jumping back to the, the partners, like what's an example of, or how would you advise someone like when they're evaluating, let's say partners, or what's an example of a bad partner you've had to let go or problems they've caused you had to solve that come to mind? Yeah, there's two, of, I'll give you two examples. The first one is just, they don't do their job properly. Even you just keep monitoring them and you show, you share the analytics with them. So we had this fulfillment center that kept like messing up the packouts and 5% of their packouts had missing items. And, you know, we do refunds and we show them all of that and we explain, we try to tra train them and support them on like fixing the issue. And we did it over and over and over and then it didn't get fixed. So it was just pure incompetence, but we could detect it and um, fix it. In this case, it was by not working with them anymore. And in some other cases, it's just um, people who don't have the data. And so the tech is not, cannot help if you don't have the data. And so we would go and like, hey, we would like access to your pick packs at the end of the day. And they're like, no, we can't give you access to that. And then we can't really monitor them. And so we don't even work with people like that because they're too old school and they can't work um, for us. So these are like examples of bad relationships we had or like, you know, an eight. We all had the agency that didn't work out because they weren't quick enough or they weren't responding to slacks or stuff like that. Right. Um, yeah, I guess it comes down to like, and this is the kind of business that we're in because we're a people-based business. I mean, it comes down to like partnership and actually it sounds like like being willing to do the extra work to solve problems on the partner's end. Um, yeah, there's that. There's So for example, for peak support, their 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 teams are on our Slack, so they're on our stand up. Not everyone, obviously, not every customer agent, customer support agent, is on our Slack. But we have team leads that are on our Slack every week, that we talk to, that we can do strategic meetings with, work on like the reporting, for example, that Peak Support does is very good. So Peak Support is actually one of the outliers where we didn't build a lot of tech to see what how they're doing because they it comes out of the box. When you partner with them, they build out these like dashboards for you that are you know pure CX, so you can see like what ticket per hour, the volumetrics on your ticket, the CSAT and DSAT. But they do other things for you for you, that are specific to your business. So you share the data with them, and then they can tell you like we saw this amount of like crushed croissants this week, and they build that for you, so you don't have to build it. If you we you know we have like food safety issues, like a, a product arrived and the packaging was ripped. Not only you can train them on what to do and all of that, that's obvious, but they can report that in a very, you know, quantitative way uh, every week on at stand up. So like communication is very important. Having them embedded within the team is very important uh, to have that as a partner. We're trying to get everyone, every agency, every vendor on Slack because you know you don't want like the carriers are an example of a very bad relationship you, ups doesn't show up you have frozen products waiting to be shipped the truck doesn't come to pick them up you call nobody replies they're not on slack they're <laughs> <laughs> and then you start screaming in <laughs> in the office and so luckily we have good reps now and we can fix these uh it's not as fast as on slack but Somehow, so communication is very important. Uh, reporting allows me as a tech person to not have to build the reporting itself. Uh, and so when we look at vendors, not only we look at, hey, can you do the job? Can you do it well? We do a lot of reference calls and talk to other people who worked with them and we spend the time actually doing it. And then we look at their data, we look at the way they communicate and then we make a decision to work or not with them. Cool. Uh, where are we on uh, the time from Javi? I don't even know. Or we don't have a rep here from the PDC experts. Um, <laughs> we can keep going. I guess we can keep going. <laughs> um, yeah, can you break out again the, the way that the Peak Support team is split on those, those functions and, and what they're doing? Yeah, that's also like 
part of the reasons why we were able to stay lean is we, so peak support is like, you know, it's not your average customer support company. You can obviously do customer support. They have these trainers, you train the trainers once and then you never train them again. And then they keep, you know, whenever you need 10 more people, I text our team lead and I say, I need 10 more people for January because it's a high growth month for us. And they just take care of that. I don't have to take care of it. But then we start relying on them for other lines of businesses. So for example, our influencer program, my marketing team trained four peak support agents to just do all the outreach, you know, sliding into the influencers DM, maintaining the relationship, making sure they're posting, making sure they're reposting when we have, when they have obligations of reposting and things like that. And so the, that part was done with peak. Uh, and then we do ops stuff. So ops and retention. So for example, when we do perishables and we have a lot of problems on day to day, like, you know, UPS didn't pick up. So we need to reach out to customers today to tell them that that happened. And so the ops team is tightly knit with the peak support ops team and they will just send them proactive tickets on Gorgeous to tell them, hey, this happened, we're sorry, we're working on the fix. Uh, we do things like monitor orders that are in the queue that didn't ship for more than three days. We have automatic alerts that are sent to peak support to tell them, hey, contact this member, their order didn't go out. We have automatic review follow-ups. Same thing every, every time someone leaves a review on our website, it creates a, a, that's under four stars. We send it to peak support, they follow up. Cancellation follow-up when someone cancels their subscription and we see that there's something we can do, it's sent automatically to their ops team and, and they do that. So we have proactive support, reactive support, operations and marketing all working with, uh, with peak. Yeah, it's a high touch. That's a lot of support. I mean, for yeah, the we size, have forty. We have forty yeah, people. Yeah, for the size of your company, you guys, it's a, it's a big team of agents making sure that everybody's getting taken care of. Yeah, it's 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 forty people. I don't have to. You know, the biggest part that I guess you didn't highlight enough is not doing HR work as a founder. Just you know, peak support takes care of everything HR related. You know, background checks, all of that, hiring, staffing. Uh, firing sometimes when people are not pulling their weight, they I don't have to tell them that that's happening. I just get notified that hey, this person w wasn't doing their job. We're gonna onboard them and get them out. And yeah, we have pretty. I'm pretty happy about just that part because we do HR on our small team, and it's <laughs> a lot of work on me. So I can see how managing 40 people would be something that wait, I don't. Want to <laughs> you do. don't want to do. I don't want to do. Um, cool. Maybe we just opened for questions. I have a feeling we've got to be getting close here. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting how uh, involved in the tech development and custom development industry we were talking. I was just putting a Facebook on your site. And it's a beautiful custom built site. I have, so I have two questions. One is, um, did you always kind of, did you start the brand with like a custom headless kind of build? Or did you start more with like a Shopify? Shopify theme. Shopify, is it still? Yeah, it's still like... Uh, no, it's a Shopify theme that I customize myself on Liquid. Like, okay. Wow, very cool. And then my second question is, um, I noticed that you're really heavy into email opt-in right away, so much so that I can't even make a purchase without deciding am I giving them my email or not right away. And I'm curious, was it always like that for you as well? Or what, when did you decide to make that decision to kind of force the, uh, the email opt-in? So yeah, it's a very counterintuitive customer experience move to not allow people to see your price and put that email gate so early. We saw that it's just worth it. Uh, when you spend so much money on paid, you basically want to get the email as soon as possible. We have a justification to ask for the email is to claim free croissants for life promo. And so we give you that justification, give you that urgency, and then we get a lot more emails than your average DTC store. No idea. I need to, I should know. I don't know. Yeah. So we have, we look at two numbers. We look at three numbers. We look at attrition rate which is how many people were scheduled to get a charge this month. 
and then how many actually did at the end of the month. And so that attrition, so it's people who just pushed, they didn't cancel, but they just didn't buy. And then we look at um, churn, which is how many canceled their subscription, which is around between six and 8% um, every month. And then the last piece is reorder rate, which is kind of the opposite of attrition, how many people actually reordered this month. You can have like people who order twice, three times a month because we have gifting options and things like that. So we work a lot on those retention tactics. We One hack that I can give anyone who can on their website right now who has a subscription is gift on skip. So we have a thing where if you go to reschedule your box, it shows you a little pop-up and tells you, hey, instead of rescheduling, just send it to somebody else. And we're generating like, I think 50 grand a month just on that feature. So we do a lot of like very, is what was mentioned this morning about touch points and reviewing all your touch points and seeing like, what can we do here? What can we do here? What can we do? So are you constantly also finding like Yeah, not always. We have seasonality. We spend about 75% of our marketing in Q1 and Q4, and then Q2 and Q3 is a little slower. So we lose members a little bit during the slow season, and then we increase, and we start growing again uh, and backfill all of that and grow after that. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, guys.